The movie I'm going to talk about today is a prime example of why some people shouldn't make their own movie. But if you've ever wanted to make your own website, you can do that with Squarespace. That's right, Squarespace. If you're planning to finally launch that new business or just want to show off what you're into, Squarespace can help you do it. Whether you're into photography, painting, cooking, or hey, maybe you're just into nerdy stuff like me, you can build a website to market yourself with Squarespace's easy to use design tools. There's dozens of ready to go templates to choose from. You never have to download, upgrade, or install anything ever, and you're reformatted for mobile devices automatically. You can also use the surplus of marketing tools and analytics Squarespace gives you access to so you can see where your site's visitors are coming from, how long they're staying for, and what pages are the most popular. So if you're interested in joining the thousands of other people who've used Squarespace to make their dreams a reality, just go to squarespace.com slash Brandon Tenold and sign up for your free trial. Then when your site's looking good and ready for launch, use the promo code Brandon Tenold for 10% off your first purchase. All right, let's get into it. Ooh, I got a real treat for you today, people. I have a So Bad It's Good movie that is right up there with the Miami Connections, the Samurai Cops, and even, dare I say it, the rooms of cult cinema. This movie deserves to be a midnight movie favorite, and if this video helps make that happen even just a little bit, I can die knowing that I've truly done the Lord's work. Champagne and Bullets is a 1993, uh... I guess, crime thriller that is largely the work of one man, John DeHart, who not only wrote, produced, and co-directed the movie, but also stars in the lead role and contributes several songs to the movie's soundtrack. Much like Tommy Wiseau, DeHart wanted to make his own movie, so he did, even managing to convince some Hollywood character actors like Wings Hauser and William Smith to be in it. In case you haven't heard of it, it's also known by several different titles. There was a highly edited version called Road to Revenge that cut out most of the nudity and violence, and there was also a version called Get Even, or Get Even, I guess, that was talked about on Red Letter Media, but for this video, I'm doing the original Champagne and Bullets version. And when I say this movie deserves to be in the So Bad It's Good Hall of Fame, I mean it. There's a few videos about this movie on YouTube, but there needs to be more, damn it. And if you still don't believe me, just check out this opening theme song. Drinking champagne and loving you till the break of dawn. Champagne and bullets. The opening song sounds like something Trey Parker would make for an episode of South Park. And the weird thing is, it's probably the best one in the whole movie. I'm not really sure what's going on here, but it looks like whoever lives in that trailer is about to get Waco'd. I feel a hell of a lot better if we had a warrant. We get some dope, we'll get a warrant. And if we don't find any dope, we'll plant some. Easy peasy. You see, boy, that's a difference between you and me. I have ears on the street. I'm gonna be a lieutenant while you're still pounding the pavement. This is funny because I always thought you'd be a lieutenant because you had your nose halfway up the cabin. It was the staff Christmas party and I was drunk. How many times do I have to explain this? Now that they're done arguing, they can finally bust Tony Rents a Trailer in Montana here. All right, fellas, all we gotta do is divvy up this baking soda and we'll be making sugar cookies in no time, okay? Unfortunately, things go south when he decides to do the say hello to my little friend line. Oh, you son of a bitch, you shot Wings Hauser. You deserve the death penalty just for that, asshole. It's okay, though, Wings ain't dead. And weirdly enough, this won't be the only time I'll have to tell people that. And if you thought the action's been incredible so far, get a load of this. What's your problem, Normad? You almost got Huck killed. Oh, boy. You know, if that guy dies, we're doing the whole world a favor. Ah! Oh shit, he almost need that guy in the crotch. All right, I should probably explain just who the hell everybody is. John DeHart plays our main character, Rick Bodie. Wings Hauser plays his friend and partner, Huck Finney. And the guy with the raspy voice is Normad. I guess he only goes by one name. Cut to a year later and Normad is taking Rick and Finney to court. Uh, tell us in your own words what you observed in the behavior of these two officers that led you to believe that they were involved in drug-related activities. Okay, so let me get this straight. Out of everyone in this courtroom, this is the guy who isn't involved with drugs. Gotcha. And when I say this movie stretches things to get over an hour and a half, check out this testimonial. Well, sir, they, um... 
They started coming late for their shifts. Uh, some of the officers covered for them. Their eyes were, were weird, you know, like someone who uses drugs, you know, dilated. I thought I might just do a little investigating on my own. Anyway, sir, since uh, their shift was beginning as mine was ending, they went into a donut shop. <laughs> well, there's nothing really unusual about that, sir. Well, they pulled into this, uh, what I would call a pet pit. What I would call a pander's vehicle. You know, sir, it was very long and low. Had a myriad of fancy paint. Very, very shiny. Jesus Christ! Get to the point, dude! Excuse me, excuse me. This is a lie. That'll be enough, Officer Finney. Wait, you're telling him that's enough? Tell the other guy to wrap it up. Okay, long story short, Normad says he saw the other two doing coke. And to be honest, they do look like the types of guys that do coke on the weekends, but this guy is still a narc for snitching on him. To make matters worse, Wings Hauser picks up an additional charge for air assaulting a police officer. It doesn't really lead to much, though. They just get kicked off the force. And even that they don't really seem to care about. They're here. Absolutely. Okay, even if they did get caught doing coke, seems like it was worth it. See, look, Rick's already got a new job pretending to drive drunk douchebags around through a black hole. Hey, driver! We need a pit stop! Pull aside! Look, just pee in one of the empty Schlitz bottles Rick's got in the back seat. That's what he does on a long drive. Rick ends up just leaving him by the side of the road, so I guess he's gonna need to find another job. I hear 7-Eleven's hiring. Meanwhile, Huck now seems to be a housewife that's married to Old Chief Woodenhead? I guess. Get sure, get dressed, get going. We're dancing. We're dancing? Come on, dance. Yeah, time to get loose in the hottest joint in town, a room in the director's house that has arcade machines in it. No joke, John DeHart used to run a video arcade and put some of the machines in his house for the bar scenes. All right, as much as I make fun, I am a little jealous of this guy's house. Rick's, where the drinks are always on the house. Because that's where he is. Oh, and Rick's ex-girlfriend Cindy is there too. Well, this is awkward. Look, Rick, I don't know what it is we have to talk about. Nothing's changed since I left. Some things have. Like what? Like I quit the force. You quit? Quit, got fired, what's the difference? I also quit my chauffeur job. I mean, I'm probably gonna get fired for leaving people out in the middle of nowhere, so I just thought I'd quit anyway. Why'd we break up, sweetheart? Is it cause your dad didn't approve? That son of a bitch hasn't liked me from the time I used to babysit him. Hey, you know what this movie could really use? Some karaoke. Well, it's weak and it's sliding all across the floor. Proving too much you stop and do some more. Oh yeah, I love this song. It's called It's My Movie and I'll Sing If I Want To. Oh, you're on fire when I grab you by the hand. Your waist is moving with the rhythm of the band. Well, I will say, John DeHart does do a pretty good job playing a drunk guy trying to sing at a bar. Too bad I think it's supposed to be serious. I'm not joking, he does an entire song here. I swell up as you take me for a ride. Come on, pretty baby, let's do the shimmy slide. Somebody achy break this guy's legs and get him off the stage. Well, at least the crowd seems to like it. Hey, I forgot how great you can sing. That's probably because he can't. And look, dude, if you're planning on getting back with your ex, maybe don't hire strippers to perform at your house. How disgusting. I can't believe this. This place looks like Sunday school compared to what I saw in your apartment Friday night. You're full of shit. And this is not an apartment. It's a public place. It's clearly some guy's house. Things get a little tense when a group of thugs wander in from the living room and start making trouble. And I think I figured out why this place has so many arcade machines. Get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> It's because all of the fight sound effects are from Street Fighter. Seriously, I swear I didn't add these sound effects. Well, if they're already using those sounds, I suppose while I'm here... That's it? That's all you can take? Wake your ass up! You win. Perfect. Finney ends up getting arrested, but luckily he's bailed out by Rick and some lady who looks like a bimbo-fied Slim Jim. You'll have to try a lot harder than that to offend me. Well, don't worry, I'll try. And about the sound mixing in this movie... Your ass is mine. Hey, look. I'm not a problem. Shot point blank range. Hey, could you take it easy on the typewriter? I'm trying to listen to the dialogue. 
Actually, you know what? Keep typing. Oh, good. Wings is back. You know, I just want to say one thing, like, uh, from a personal observation, that the accommodations here, they, uh, I don't know, they just suck. Good thing they bailed Wings Hauser out. He's easily the best guy in this. Later on, Rick takes Cindy to a restaurant that is definitely not another room in his house. And guess how they try to kill screen time now? With street jokes. So I got a physician joke for you. It's a very attractive young lady. Goes to the doctor for a checkup. The doc doctor says, hey, you got a disrobe. She says, I'm very shy. Can we turn the lights off? He says, okay. He turns the lights off. She takes her clothes off and she says, doctor, where should I put them? He says, right over here on top of mine. <laughs> I got another one for you, Ben. Look, just get to the one about the 10-inch pianist and wrap it up. And you know the weirdest thing about this scene? Rick isn't the cringiest person here. Hello, my name is Tamra. And the reason I've got this camera is if you really love her, you want a picture of her. Get the hell out of my house. Is this the only place you sing? No, I sing every weeknight at Cafe Cargo. You should come by sometime. Cafe Cargo? I know that place. It's in my basement. Say, if I didn't know any better, I'd say these two are getting back together. I never thought I'd be sitting across the table from you again. I thought I'd raise my standards, but I guess not. So, yeah, this is nice and all, but, uh... Are we gonna get a plot here? They sorta had one with Normad trying to frame him for drugs, but they seem to have just forgot about that. Where'd the story go? Those guys in the bar, I didn't know them. They're members of a cult of devil worshippers. Okay, wasn't expecting that, but sure, I'll take it. So out of fucking nowhere, they mentioned that Cindy was previously a member of a cult of devil worshippers who, get this, were also led by Normad. I would have thought it'd make more sense for him to just be a crooked cop and drug dealer, but sure, he could be a Satanist too, I guess. Throughout the ages, Satan has guided us in his own divine way. We love you, Satan. I can't hear you. We love you, Satan. There, that's better. All right, now that we've established we love Satan, let's all get drunk and listen to Merciful Fate. No, stop. You can't go through with this. All right, fine. We'll listen to Celtic Frost instead. Have it your way, Cindy. The coven sacrifices a baby as part of their ritual, although Cindy doesn't really seem that affected by it. The crowd I got into, they, they started getting involved in a coven. I just kind of fell into it. I... It was like this phase I went through one summer where I was a Satanist, but I just kind of grew out of it. I'm more into astrology now. And if you thought this movie couldn't think of any more ways to kill screen time. To be or not to be, that is the question. Rick actually does a soliloquy from Hamlet. By the way, I swear I didn't make this edit. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. And thus, it's almost like the movie tried to cut him off, but the director vetoed it. Anyway, the coven members are now after Cindy, which is what the guys in the bar slash director's man cave were doing earlier. Why they didn't just kill her right away, I have no idea, but whatever. So looks like we finally got a plot. Sorta. By the way, I should mention that Cindy is played by Pamela Jean Bryant, who was a former Playboy playmate. And if you think that John DeHart cast her so that he could put a sex scene with her in the movie, you guess correct, my friend. Starting over. Starting over. Yeah, ever wanted to see your Uncle Bob make a sex tape with his mail order bride? Why in the hell would you want that? And check out the music here. Starting over. Feel like you're gonna fly. Ugh, you know what? I think I'm gonna dub something a little sexier over this. Hang on a second. My mind starts to drift right into space and the words get stuck in my tongue. After that, Rick goes to the bar to tell Finney that he got back with Cindy. That well, makes sense. It is in the next room. Me and Cindy are getting back together again. Gonna spend a couple weeks at Duke's and then uh, get a place to borrow? You're already at your own place. Eh, whatever. I'm just glad Wings Hauser's back. So you will, will you just leave me hanging out there again? Okay, who's Hamlet? Who gives a shit? Okay? Don't worry, I'll get... I, I, I'll be fine. Okay, I'm convinced Wings Hauser actually got shit-faced and just made up his own dialogue.
as he should have. You know what? I really don't give a fuck who wrote it. Also what Wing said when he saw the script. Oh, and as far as the story goes, I guess Huck's wife is cheating on him and divorcing him, I guess. You nailed her, didn't you, huh? I mean, you made it with her, didn't you? I never spent five minutes with your wife, and you know it. I can only last two, maybe three minutes tops. You know that. You know what? I don't really care what the story is, as long as it leads to more of Wingshauser being drunk and weird. <laughs> Gas. Credit card. Okay, if the rest of the movie was just more of this, I wouldn't mind that. Oh man, I had this horrible dream I was in this shitty movie. I think it was called, uh, Watchers 3? Huck's ex-wife comes by to say he's late on alimony payments. Um, wasn't there a satanic cult in this movie? What the hell happened with that? A lady's got a dress. Yeah, a lady's got a dress, huh? A lady's got a fucking dress for who? Actually, you know what? I'll just take Wings Hauser flipping out. It's fine. That is when we can actually hear what the characters are saying since the weird sound mixing is back. You Look at me. Let's just say he was one of Huh? Can you speak up? I can't hear you over the soundtrack. And that's not the only weird thing going on with the soundtrack. Just listen to this. Man, I'm sitting on the couch. Yes, I had a couple of beers. You understand? What you're not getting is this bitch here is punishing me because I didn't pay her on time. What is it, Casio having a seizure? What's with the music? Oh, you're on fire when I grab you by the hand. Okay, okay, the music's fine. Just don't go back to that. Oh, hey, Normad. I talked to my ex. Uh, he says you're supposed to take a bigger part in the plot. Well, don't get mad at her. You agreed to do this movie. You know, I'm starting to think this crooked cop slash satanic cult leader might be a little sleazy. Oh, and apparently Normad's a judge now. I guess he uses the robes as part of his satanic rituals. And don't put Wings Hauser away. He's the most entertaining guy in this movie. For Christ's sake, who the hell do you think you are, huh? I mean, to me, you're just some asshole in a black dress. You know what? I suggest pearls and pantyhose, then you'd be perfect. Why do I get the feeling that pearls and pantyhose was one of the alternate titles for this movie? Finney gets sent to jail. Hopefully he adjusts to life on the inside. <laughs> How's it going, man? Hey, Mr. Hauser. I really liked you in Vice Squad. And come on, Wings, don't drink bleach. The movie's only got 40 minutes left, I promise. Hello, Mr. Finney. I'm Sister Mary Rebecca. <laughs> Did they just leave a blooper in the movie? What am I saying? This whole movie's a blooper. There's no life circumstance that our savior can't help you with. Okay, so uh, could you ask our savior to uh, help me out with the rent? I mean, you see the kind of movies I have to do to make ends meet? I'm Wings Hauser, dammit, I shouldn't have to do this. Hey, Finney, I heard you swallowed some bleach. Good thing I have a hospital bed in one of my spare rooms. Later, Rick and Cindy drive to Cindy's parents' house to get her stuff, and I'm not 100% convinced this isn't just the director's house again. I told you never to bring your friends home. Shouldn't be a problem, sir. I'm just here to help her move her clothes. I won't have your kind in my home. Your kind? Oh, I get it. It's because my 23 and me said I'm 164th black, isn't it? Who are you? Hey, come on, man. It's me, Rick. We went to school together. You know, I was in grade 12, you were in grade 9. Anyway, now I'm plowing your daughter. Well, Cindy's parents may not have been very nice, but at least they got the rest of her collection of blue jumpsuits. Oh, and see if you can guess where the movie goes from here. I'll be with you when you want me. That's right, another sex scene. Yeah, not since Tommy Wiseau's The Room has the screen crackled with such raw sexual electricity. <laughs> what a story, Mark. And once again, check out the music. Something I've got to know right now. Do you want me everlastingly? Every song in this sounds like a parody but I really don't think they are. Okay, time to dub something sexier in here. Things that bother you never bother me. I feel happy and fine. Ha -ha! Well, that killed about five minutes of screen time. And my boner. Anyway, what's Wings doing? Number one. He said you never get down on anything unless you know something about it right from here. Okay, I have no idea what the hell he's doing, but... 
Sure, I'll watch it. Oh, wait a minute, he's having a pool party with some hoes. Oh, that makes sense. What am I doing? Uh, uh, reciting the uh, noble, noble noises of Huckism, man. You know, I mean, it's built on, uh, built on this new religion I've developed about Huckleberry Finn. No, seriously, this is a great theology. I mean, take off your clothes, leave your clothes on, get in the pool, man, look. This is what's happening. And I see he did all of the cocaine from the opening scene. Seriously, he's still going. Huckleberry Finn, Huckleberry Finn, what'd he do, huh? He had the courage. He had the courage, man, to go upriver, not downriver. He didn't go downriver, he went upriver. Who'd he go upriver with? He went upriver with a slave named Jim. I mean, the, uh, Huckleberry Finn is beyond, he's beyond Moses leading uh, the Israelites, you know, out of ever, wherever they came from, into the promised land. I don't know what in the hell Wings is on, but I want some. So, yeah, um, wasn't there a satanic cult that was after Cindy? Uh, what, uh, what happened with that? Is that still a thing? Oh, well, it looks like Rick's getting married. And he even remembered to wear his best tracksuit for the occasion. We are here today to join this lovely couple in holy matrimony. Hey, uh, Reverend, could you hurry up with the vows? Wings Hauser looks like he really has to pee back there. Okay, now that they're married, three guesses as to where this goes. That's right. Who needs plot when you can just throw in another sex scene? And by the looks of things, Rick wants to make it a threesome. Now I'm gonna show you what kind of girl you really married. One who can do a hell of a lot better than this guy. So don't stop loving me. Don't stop caring for me. Holy shit, it's the villains. Does this mean we're actually gonna have a story in the last 20 minutes? Yeah, there's one thing more you should know. We spotted that girl, Cindy. It was so long ago, we forgot to tell you, boss. Normad tells his goons to take care of Cindy, but they better hurry, the movie's almost over. So yeah, how come this place is so dead tonight? I don't know, maybe the director's just not having people over tonight. Meanwhile, Cindy makes an amazing discovery that she really should have made by now. Is that cop, Rick? That's Normad. That's him. That's the high priest of the coven. I probably should have realized Normad was the cult leader earlier, but hey, better late than never, right? He's the one who murdered the baby. What? Really? We're going to the police. Yeah, you know, the thing you should have done as soon as you witnessed a baby getting sacrificed. Unfortunately, before they're able to do that, some of Normad's goons engage them in an exciting medium speed chase sequence. You know, I could make fun of this, but honestly, I'm just glad they're not killing time with another sex scene. And what the hell? Cindy's dead? When did that happen? Oh no, Cindy, I was hoping we were gonna grow old together. I mean, I was gonna do that way before you, but you get the idea. Normally a murder-revenge plot like this would occur towards the beginning of a movie and not right before the end, but I guess they had to make sure to get three sex scenes in before they killed Cindy off. So with Cindy dead, Rick has no choice but to take the law into his own hands. But if he wants revenge, he's gonna need to train hard. All right, you know what, Rick? Maybe just call the cops. Or go bow hunting, whatever you feel like. It's weird that a movie called Champagne and Bullets only really becomes an action movie in the last 10 minutes. The rest of it is just two middle-aged guys hanging out and not really doing anything. This movie should have been called Miller Light and Alimony. But despite the shift in tone, nice to know the weird editing is back. Hey there, Double Ugly. Did Rick just turn into another guy? What was that? Seriously, that was an edit worthy of a Turkish movie. Hey there, Double Ugly. Oh, and I guess Normad's doing a drug deal that goes wrong. I thought he was doing Satanist shit now. Yeah, whatever, as long as he's the bad guy. <laughs> all right, Normad, you're gonna die for putting colored lighting gels all over my house. Huh, this live-action Lethal Enforcers movie is really weird. 
don't shoot! Rick confronts Normad, although I'm not sure from where. Is he in the Phantom Zone? Wow, you've got enough dope there to do 30 years, Normad. Yeah, or finance 30 more movies like this one. Oh no, getting snuck up on. My one weakness. Damn, what the hell is Rick gonna do? <laughs> Yeah, Wings Hauser to the rescue. Oh, but of course he gets shot again. This is John DeHart's vanity project, which means only he gets to kill the villain. It's me again. Hey, Rick. Where the hell are you right now? That looks like Rick's been practicing his moves more than I thought. He even does a Steven Seagal-style arm break on this guy. Although, to be honest, even Steven Seagal's newer movies are more polished than this. Can't believe I'm saying that. All right, Rick, you avenged Cindy's death and resolved what little plot this movie had. Oh, but the movie's not over yet. See if you can guess what happens next. Go ahead, guess. Let me know in the comments what you think is gonna happen. You ready? Okay, here it is. There's someone here who wants to see you. Cindy. All right, I can't believe you're alive. Sure, sure, why, why not? And that's about as much of an epilogue as we get as it ends pretty abruptly. Damn, even the soundtrack couldn't wait to get the hell out of here. Oh boy, where do I even start with this movie? Much like The Room, this is the kind of hilariously inept, unself-aware vanity project that can only result from being made with complete earnestness and passion. Pretty much everything about it, from the awkward fight choreography, the cringy, gratuitous sex scenes, the weird edits, the plot lines that seem to come and go as they please. Hell, even Wings Hauser seemingly being drunk and just making up his own dialogue seems like stuff you'd normally see in a parody of this type of movie. But it's not. It's serious. And that is why it deserves a place in the Bad Movie Hall of Fame alongside stuff like Samurai Cop, Miami Connection, Neil Breen's filmography. Take your pick. But you know something? I can make fun of John DeHart all I want, but the fact is, the guy wanted to make his own movie, and he did it. And now, 30 years later, I'm talking about it. And even in the deepest, snarkiest recesses of my heart, I kind of got to respect that. Plus, I am still a little jealous of his house. Well, it's all for now. Until next time. See you in hell, you son of a bitch. Not a problem.